Hi guys, Will Terry here. Um, got a video today for my blog, um, answering some questions that came in from some people that have been reading my blog. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to my blog, it's willterry.blogspot.com. There should be a link right down here. And um, that's where you can catch up on all the, the stuff that, that I have going on right now. Um, so I'm just going to answer these questions one at a time. And this is blog post from Sunday, June 30th, 2013. What questions do you have? So the first one is from Guy. And he says, when are we going out to lunch? And we did. Thanks, Guy. And then uh, the next one's from Evil Robot. Wondering if you had any advice or tips on lighting and image and how the brightness of an object can change depending on material or color. That in and of itself is a great question and that would take a long time to really try to delve into and I'm not even an expert on that um, but that could be like a YouTube video kind of like a demo thing in Photoshop but what I do I think the thing that, that might help the most um, is whenever I want to light something and I, I try to visualize in my mind what I want it to look like and you know, usually I'll get an idea, usually, because I'm usually illustrating for children's books, so often what will happen is I'll have a mood or a scene that has already been set up with a description, so I'm already getting ideas, and then um, what I'll do is I'll go hunting online for photo reference. So I just did a, a piece, actually, of uh, a cowboy walking his horse into the sunset for the end of this book. And I knew that I wanted it to be, have those really orangey, uh, and it's, yesterday was the 4th of July, they're still lighting off fireworks, so you might hear that in this video a few times. Um, but anyway, I wanted to have that orangey kind of um, colored, flavored light in, in the, the piece, and so uh, I went and found a bunch of images like that, and I looked and saw the colors, and I saw how the light was hitting other objects in the picture, and basically just using using reference, I think, that's the best advice I can give you right now, other than maybe getting a book like, I know that um, James Gurney has a really good book, and he talks about lighting um, in one of his, and um, there's probably a lot of references online. Okay, next one from Leopard Canna. How do you value rendering of an image of a student of yours, especially those who are averagely good? Since your paintings are well, well worked and very refined, do you ask them to follow your style? or ask them to improve theirs, or or are there any other standards in rendering or working uh, the art that have to be in a particular way, for example, Disney way or Pixar way. So he's talking about rendering and how I advise. So I think every teacher has a bias, and we have certain things that we like, and I think the trick is um, to try to give good advice and, and not always let your bias come through. It's I think it's impossible to not let it come through to some extent. But I love all different types of art. Even though I stick with one style, I appreciate all different kinds of art. From really loose, uh, scratchy line work, uh, primitive line work, to uh, more refined stuff, to more painterly. Um, I like stuff that looks really digital, and I like stuff that looks really traditional. I love watercolors when they're done right, or, or done well. Um, so I don't... Just because I paint one way doesn't mean I, I only like that one thing. So um, I, I think that you can say this, and one of the things, and I've talked about it in videos before, is that in, in schools, often visual arts, in fact, I just did a video on this, the, the, visual, the visual arts in, in colleges are often not taught at all. I mean, the, there's no standards, there's no, um, there's no principles. It's just turn you loose and paint. And I've talked about how musicians and how um, actors, they get rules. And writers, they get rules to follow. Um, and if, if, Art is no different. So if you look at, um, for instance, if you look at food, you, you can, if you go to a restaurant, pretty much most people have a, a set of standards or a set of tastes that they appreciate and a set of tastes that they don't appreciate so much. And um, I even appreciate the fireworks going on. But there are certain things that we don't appreciate in food. And so if somebody came in without any training and just decided, you know, I'm just going to be really creative and create something. 
chances are they're not going to do as good as someone who was trained. Um, and I, I think the same thing typically for illustrators. It doesn't mean you can't train yourself. It doesn't mean you can't learn on your own. But it does mean that there are certain, uh, certain principles and rules that need to be followed most of the time, not all the time. Broken sometimes when there's a good reason. Um, and I think that when you talk about if they're if they're rendering standards or if this the the student is uh, is rendering not up if you're saying they're not rendering up to my level, um, do I still appreciate it or what do I advise them? Um, I think what I try to do is advise them towards I try to look at their style or what they're going after, what the intent is in their portfolio. And I try to give them advice based on that. It's not always, I try not to turn everybody into me. That's, that's one of the reasons why a lot of teachers don't teach, is they're afraid that they're going to turn their students into themselves. They're afraid that they're going to have copycats. They're afraid that their students are going to make more money than them, whatever. Um, that's just a bunch of baloney. So, yes, I, I, I try to um, help give advice for that student for their particular style. I hope that answers your question. Okay, the next one is for Angela. I uh, love your YouTube videos. My question would be, how do you pick your color schemes? Do you just use what looks good? Uh, do you have techniques for picking colors, especially for digital work? Okay, so, and, and I've talked about this in, I have a color video on Folio Academy where I actually talk about this, but just in short, I mean, what I try to do in picking color schemes is, and, and I'm starting to change a little bit, but basically, you know, I do use a lot of reference to get an idea. Um, it's, it's, it would probably shock a lot of you how much reference I do use um, because I really want to get in my mind a direction that I'm going for because I find if I don't have a direction to go into then I end up with a lot of things that just aren't working. You know, It's almost like if you were making up a recipe um, for cookies and you really didn't have a recipe and you're just picking out ingredients and then at the end you kind of end up with a mess. So I try to really have a goal of what it's going to look like, and I really try to visualize what it's going to look like. Aside from that, if I have certain things in the, the uh, illustration that I'm doing that have to be a certain color, I typically try to build my color scheme around those colors, and especially red. If there's something that's going to be red or orange in the painting, I want to build around that because... Red, the warm colors come forward and the cool colors recede, right? So um, if one of the challenges is if, if you have something in, and then I'm talking for illustrators too, so if you have um, an illustration that has a description of, let's say, um, something that is red that's in the background, that can become a problem because that, if, it's, if it's a saturated red that you use, it's gonna it's going to capture your attention and if if the main focus should be on the foreground element let's say it's let's say the the description mentions a red building or a red schoolhouse in the background but the focus should be on the action of the characters in the foreground I, I guess what I'm saying is it, you have to be careful even though that is red in the background um, that would be a situation where that red is going to try to jump in front and take center stage or try to grab your 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 focus uh, because the red will have emphasis if you if you oversaturate it. I'm I'm probably making this more complicated, but but basically if you if you have certain things that have to be a certain color, um, let me give you an example of what you wouldn't want to do. You wouldn't want an object that has to be red in in your picture, like an apple or something, or a, someone's shirt, and then you wouldn't want to then pick a different red another red that's not the same red just because you decided to put another red in there. A lot of this question probably goes to color harmony and uh, color harmony really has to do with uh, incorporating the same colors over and over and over uh, repetition. One of the design principles is unity so you want to have um, you want to have color the same colors repeating throughout either in spots or actually mixing in with the other colors. Um, and if you're struggling with color, I would suggest trying to use a triad, which is to pick a red, a yellow, and a blue. It could be, green could be your yellow, uh, purple could be your blue, and 
and orange could be your your warm color, your red. So you can just pick three colors and then if you use those you'd be amazed what you can do with those and because you're only using those three colors and having to mix them to get other colors you're going to have you're going to automatically have color harmony uh, using a triad is the best way to solve that okay um, let's see and then Lori asks uh, let's see uh, okay so she has a really technical question about scanning um, getting shadows and stuff with her traditional pencil work um, when she goes into Photoshop these guys were not lighting off anything when I decided to make this video tonight it's hilarious how you can <laughs> make things like that happen um, I'm gonna defer and say and not try to answer a question that I'm not an expert at I, there's nothing worse than getting directions from somebody who really doesn't know the place that you're trying to get to um, and then they lead you on a wild goose chase so I'm not gonna do that I would suggest though that you try to, if you're on Facebook, try to join the, there's a group called Illustration and that's all it is, it's a, it's a, it's not a private group, it's an open group, it's called Illustration and if you put that, your same question out there, I'll bet you somebody would know um, how to help you with that one. Or other online forums as well. Okay, and then Rebecca um, says, uh, I am ready to begin marketing my art after getting it where I want it to be. I've never worked for myself before. Any advice you can give um, about being your own business person as an illustrator would be lovely. There's a lot of contradictory advice. Should one look for representation or try to do it all on their own? And that's a really good question. Now we've got a fire engine that's going to come and probably help somebody that just got blown up outside. So it could get noisy. Um, you know, now i got to read this question again. Um, being your own business person. You know, now, more than ever, and, I, and I've talked about this before. <laughs> this is fun, having these explosions going off. Um, now more than ever, we have the opportunity to use the internet. Um, and representation, or using representation, um, what am I trying to say? If, let's say, let's say, um, let's say that the world of illustration started today. Okay? So yesterday or last week, there weren't any illustrators. There weren't any freelance illustrators. But today, all of a sudden, illustrators started to come out of the woodworks and started to get jobs and stuff. What I'm saying is, I don't think, and, and please, you know, feel free to contradict me um, if you have any differing, differing opinions, but I don't think that we would have reps today if, um, if we were starting the, the illustration world today with the internet. The reason that I say that isn't because reps aren't valuable, and isn't because reps don't do a great job, and isn't because they don't provide a valuable service. It's because I don't think they would ever get started because I don't think anybody or most people or enough people would feel like they needed them. Because you can contact and you can find people anywhere online. Um, and you can, it, it's, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of the rep was you know, you're in one city or one town somewhere, and the rep is in New York or L.A. And you can't be there to show your portfolio, so they take your portfolio around. And the, the reps doing things online now has really, has really basically become uh, an extension of what they were, what they really started out being valuable doing. Um, and I, I really, if you know, if any of my reps or friends that are reps or are watching this please don't don't feel like I think that you're not valuable and that you don't provide a great service for your illustrators all I'm really saying is I think that right now if you're um, if you're motivated as an illustrator you you can do it on your own you know you really don't need someone else to help you and I think the biggest danger of getting someone else to help you is that one you're gonna leave a lot of eggs in their basket and if they don't come through then you're sitting there waiting and if they do 
are able to get work for you if something goes wrong with that relationship, which is exactly what happened to me with one of my reps, it really put it really crippled me when I left that rep because I had to kind of start to scramble and start to 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 create contacts um, with with former um, contacts and also get new contacts and new clients on my own. Um, I think right now there's really no excuse to not do it on your own. Um, it's it's hard work, but it's work that can definitely be done. And um, I, I'll tell you right now, reps are having a hard time right now. So, okay. Um, I hope I answered your question. Okay, so this next one comes from Teresa. And um, she says, what do you recommend to keep one's drawing skills sharp and develop them into their highest potential? Um, and one answer that you're going to hear over and over again that I totally agree with is to draw constantly, to draw every day, and that drawing is a muscle and that you get better with drawing. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I draw a lot. And I I'm talking about, like, a lot. Like, you really, really love drawing, and you love it so much. Like, what you'll find is, you'll, if you look at the people that, if you're on Pinterest, the people that you're pinning, if you look at the blogs that you go to, if you look at um, the illustrators that you follow, that you love, I would be willing to bet anything that the ones that you're following probably love drawing more than the ones you're not following, or the ones that you don't like, or the ones that you find a problem with their work. Um, and I would, I, would, I would say that for, well, I, I know this to be true for me, the people that I, that I love uh, the, 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 the illustrator's work that I follow the most, they're the people that just love drawing. They're going to do it whether they're getting paid or not. Uh, they always have a sketchbook with them. Um, and maybe that's another thing I could say is what can you do um, to, to help your drawing skills. I made a commitment about, I think it was maybe six or seven years ago, that I would never leave home, maybe longer, I would never leave home without a sketchbook, ever. Even if I'm just running down to the corner store um, to get a medicine for, for my wife or my son or something. I mean, I, I'm going to take, and now I take my iPad. But what that's done is, sometimes you're out and something happens, you end up having to wait, you end up with some down, downtime. If I go to my in-laws, I take my sketchbook wherever I am. I literally never, ever, ever leave home without it. And what that does is it just gives you that much more time, time that you didn't even plan on where you could be drawing. I'm going to go backpacking um, next week, and I'm taking a sketchbook with me. Um, so drawing, drawing, drawing. And another thing I would say is something to work on is if you struggle with drawing the figure, you need to break it down into simple shapes more. Um, and... Um, and one, one exercise that you can do is everybody knows what a tuna fish can looks like, the, the size and proportion. So, you know, if you draw a tuna fish can and it looks like it's that tall, then it's out of proportion. Or if it looks like it's that skinny, you know, and it's, it's this big and it's this skinny like a plate, then it's out of proportion. Everybody should be able to draw a tuna fish can. Once you can draw a tuna fish can over and over and over again, you ought to be able to draw it at any angle, turned this way, that way, that way in your sketchbook over and over and over tuna fish cans looking down on them, straight down on top looking up underneath of them and every angle you can possibly conceive of you should be able to do that in your sleep once you can do that you can move on to more complex shapes once you can do that then you can move on to taking the human figure and doing the same thing and breaking it down into shapes and that's something that I think those are exercises that um, if you just do them over and over and over, you can't help but get better. Okay, and then a question from Terry. Uh, let's see. Okay, so she's talking about style and, and really trying to, and I don't want to read the whole thing because it's pretty long, but if you go on my blog, you can read hers. Um, she wants to know, you know, how, how you get your style basically... Um, I'll read the last part here. I know you covered some of this in your SVS class about being known for something, expression, value, color, architecture, etc. But in a broader sense, how can we identify that style and polish it? Also, if you do have more than one style, how do you build 
an online portfolio around that? Should you really just stick to one niche? Um, I'm a I'm a big fan of the one style. Um, I don't know any of the big illustrators in children's books that have more than one style, except maybe um, I would say Eric Roman. It might be an exception, and there's, I'm sure there's others. And um, but you know Eric Roman. One of the things that he'll do is he'll attack a book and and try to come up with a new style for each one. He won the Caldecott for My Friend Rabbit. And he does a really good job with it. It's I don't understand how he can do it, but he does. But I would say most illustrators, you know, if you think of Chris Van Allsburg, bing, a light goes off and you get an idea of what their drawing style is like. If you think of Lane Smith, bing, you know, you, you know, you get a feeling for the style of art. Um, if, you, if you think of a, a Dan Santat, you know what it looks like right away. And I think that there's something to be said for that, just like actors. You know, actors, um, you know, some of them are character actors, some of them are method actors, um, you know. But if you think of, um, you know, think of Steve Buscemi, you pretty much know you're going to get the goofy guy, right? Um, you know, and if you think of, um, uh, who's another good actor? I mean, just the, the idea that, um, you know, they, they get known for a certain body of work and you can count on them to bring that to the table. And I, I think that that's, um, for me, I think that's the way to go. Now, other people have other um, opinions on that, and that's fine. And there are other people that have done some amazing things with, with different styles, but uh, I think to make it, to have your best chance of making it to you know big, I would say have a style that people can count on. Now, to attack the how do you get that style, I think that one of the things I, I, I want you to know when I, you know, a lot of my students will, are like, man, I can just see your style come out. I want you to know I don't. I do not see my style. Um, I, I draw things the way that makes sense to me, and I'm not trying to style things out so much. In the beginning rounds, I was. In fact, I had a teacher that, that, that said when I was really struggling with style, and I thought it was really good advice, and he said, um, you know, develop a visual vocabulary for all kinds of objects that you draw. So, in other words, what does a Will Terry tree look like? And I'm like, hmm, I never thought about it like that. Well, what would I want a Will Terry tree to look like? And I, I started drawing trees, and I was like, oh, it would be fun to do this. And it, it almost it freed me up to, to experiment and to make my tree, not to draw it the way that I thought it should be drawn, but the way that I would want to see it. I think I, I think that was really good advice for me because from then on I started going well. How would I draw a barrel? How would I draw um, a flower? How would I draw a house? How would I draw a person? You know, how would I draw a dog? And um, I think things started to just kind of click. Um, and I I really do believe, and this is another thing that you'll hear over and over from different teachers, uh, illustration teachers, is you should not worry about style. That if you if you're worried about figuring out your style, it means you haven't drawn and painted enough. And I I don't want that to sound harsh to anybody, um, but I think it's true. I think that um, I think the more you do something the more your personal style will come out. And I think there's no other possible way for it to happen other than over time you emerge. I think you already have your style. I think, it, I think that what happens is you have to get, and I've said this before, you have to get all your, enough bad drawings out so that the good ones start coming in. They're starting to ramp up now. I feel like they're aiming them at my house. Like someone knows that I'm making a video right now. Um, so... Yeah, so that's it on, on style. Is you've got to get those bad drawings out so the good ones can really come. The bad paintings over and over. You know, if, if I could show you, and I, I burned and I threw away a lot of, I mean, tons and tons of tons of bad paintings. I have done, uh, at one count, and these were physical paintings, well over 2,000 illustrations for clients. That was client work. Over 2,000. You should count up how many you've done, and it took at least two thousand and more. Excuse me for me to feel like my my style was getting polished, um, and I feel like it's still evolving some.
So I think it really, really, really takes a lot of time and a lot of work to get that to get to that level. And I think you'll find the same thing with with artists that you like. I think that they they have probably painted and drawn a lot more than you have if you're still you know wanting or trying to develop your style. Okay. Uh, here's one from Leopard. Uh, when did you keep consistency of style? Um, when did you stop doing things that continue with those that, uh, those that work? Decisions to do that. Let's see. Also, how do you suggest that your students... I don't know whether I'm clear about my question. Let's see. So, did you, let's see. Stop doing some of the things. I guess his question is, when did, when did you keep consistency of your, of your style? And I kind of basically just answered that. Um, it took many, many years. Probably, oh, I mean... When I, if I look, if I was back ten years ago, I'd say, "Well, I've arrived at my style," but I look back ten years and I feel like I've refined a lot more since then. So, I think it's, I think you keep refining. I think it really took me from, you know, four years of college, still didn't know what I was going to do, but I was starting to get a style towards the end of college, and then um, I think the next five years I really started to figure out, okay. This is, I'm starting to get it, and I think the next five years, and up to about ten years, is when I really started to get the look that I was going for, and the last ten years has just been kind of polishing that. Okay, and one last question from Dark Crystal. I've had several people mention that I should consider doing personalized children's books, or have my books printed on high quality paper and selling them like table art books. Do you know anyone who is doing anything like this? Is it really a viable option? I'm unfortunately not getting any traction anywhere else. So I'm not an expert at this at all. However, I do have a book that I really, really, really want to publish on my own. And uh, I hope to be able to do it at the beginning of this coming year. It's a project that I've been working on for a while. And I think it's great to have personal projects. Um, I think it, it gives you focus. Uh, one of the goal, one of the things, just to, I know that I'm not really answering the question yet, but one of the things that I'm doing on my book is I've made, set a goal to work on it for about five to ten minutes a day because I don't want it to become this huge thing um, when I'm ready to launch it. Um, and so, but imagine what you can accomplish with about ten minutes every day for a year. I mean, it's that's one thing. If you have a lot of things going on and you just don't know where you're going to find time. Um, what's that movie with Will Smith, um, The Pursuit of Happiness? Watch Pursuit of Happiness, and, and, and don't tell me you don't have five or ten minutes here or there. I mean, that's, that's, that's an insane story about how he didn't even use the bathroom, or didn't drink as much, so he didn't have to use the bathroom as much so he could get more work done. Um, we have a lot more time than we want to admit. Okay, so as far as, as far as this goes, I'm not an expert on it at all, but I do have some friends who have done some pretty neat books on either on their own, selling them at the cons, like Comic-Con. Um, and I have some friends who have launched Kickstarter books and done really well with them. Um, and I, I would say, you know, we're living in a time, and I've, I've talked about this before too, where we have access now, because of the Internet, to the best of the best of the best that's out there. Um, do I think it's worth it to do your own book? I think it is if you have an audience and if you have um, really really good work that people really really love um, I think that I think that if your work I, I, I don't think it's probably wise to test out the market by making a book and seeing if people like it if you don't have a following and if you don't um, uh, if you if you don't have signs that people really like your work so I don't really know your work that well, so I can't advise you personally that well. But I would say this, you know, um, how do you know if if your work is good enough? And I would say, um, you know, you're getting, you're, the, the signs that you're getting is that people are buying whatever it is you are producing already. Um, so I can tell you that, like, the friends that have done books, they already have successful careers as illustrators. Um, and so they're getting feedback from clients saying, we like your stuff, we want to hire you. Um, now, I'm in the illustration world, not in the, not in the fine art world. But I would say, you know, if you're, you know, let's, let's not, I'm not talking to you, 
dark crystal, but let's say, let's say there's someone that's in their own little world, in their own little apartment, and they're creating artwork, and the artwork is really good, but let's say they, they're not online at all, they're just, they're completely, you know, closed off, and they, they don't go on Facebook, and they don't go on Twitter, and they don't have a blog, and they don't go on Instagram, or Pinterest, or any of these other um, social media sites, and they don't have a website, so nobody knows about them, but they're doing really good work, and then they make a book. I don't know really how they would sell that book. That's one option that I think would fail. The artwork could be really great, but there's no microphone to get that out. On the other hand, let's say that they're always on Facebook and always on Twitter and always blogging and always doing all these things, but the artwork isn't amazing, uh, then they can tell all the people they want about this book that they're producing, but if the work isn't amazing, then it probably won't sell either. So they really both have to be there. I think that if you're going to err on on being weaker on one thing than another, I think you can definitely afford to be weaker on social media and be weaker on with your online presence. Not to be non-existent online. Don't confuse it with that. But let's say you have a person who is spending, you know, three or four hours a day working their social media. That's probably excessive. That's way excessive. Um, and then let's say you have somebody that's only working, you know, a half an hour a day on their social media, but their artwork is just amazing. I think that they could do fine um, by announcing a book. If you look at um, look at the art of Brom, Brom's Kickstarter. I mean, he his book sold out the first printing. I think I think he's on his second printing. Um, I know my friend Jake Parker sold out his first book, Antler Boy. And he just raised sixty thousand dollars on Kickstarter for his second book, uh, drawings um, by Jake Parker. And there's a bunch of others that have done really, really well like that. But again, I think it comes down to a combination of social media and work that people really, really, really like. Um, so I think that without knowing what you're actually doing, I can't really give you good advice on that, other than to to kind of weigh those things out. Um, and I would, I would counsel against, you know, asking people um, online and saying, hey, if I made a book, would you buy it? Because a lot of people would say, yeah, I'd buy it. But the only real way to know is if, is if people vote with their wallets, you know. And uh, the only way you can actually know that is to actually do it. But prior to that, I think you should have other signs, like you're getting work or you're selling work um, or you've done other projects that have sold and things like that. So, anyway... Thanks for watching my video, and uh, I, I really appreciate all these questions. I think they were, they were amazing questions, and I will see you on my next video. Thank you.